Welcome to the Not Just a Pony Ride podcast, presented to you by Hetra University. If you've landed here, you're probably passionate about how horses help people. This podcast is for anyone who helps others experience the benefits of horses or those who have experienced it themselves. If you're in the equine assisted services industry, we're here to help you. If you're here just to learn more, you're in the right place. Welcome to your community of like-minded people where you will hear stories, education, science, and explanations about how what we do is so much more than just a pony ride. And now, from the Hetra campus in Gretna, Nebraska, here's your host, occupational therapist and CTRI, Katie Ott. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today I have something a little bit different for us. We've been getting a lot of requests about disability education and a little bit more surrounding the common diagnoses that we see and what that means for us in equine assisted services. So today I thought I would wear equal parts of my occupational therapist hat as well as my instructor hat to break down a diagnosis that I think a lot of us see in the equine assisted services industry, and that is cerebral palsy. So we're gonna dive into the different types, um, what symptoms look like, how we can help um, as an instructor, and what that means for our participants that are on horseback. So let's get into it. Cerebral palsy is the most common motor disability among children. It is a childhood disability and stays with the child into adulthood. So CP is caused by a disturbance in the early developing brain, specifically the areas of the brain that are involved with creating movement, coordinating movement, and controlling it, as well as just general posture. So most typically, cerebral palsy is associated with a disruption in oxygen-rich blood to the brain, um, and that's either before, during, or shortly after birth. So things like infant stroke, um, infant traumatic brain injury, anything that disrupts the blood flow during birth. It can also be from infant seizures or just a genetic thing that happens. The, the injury that causes cerebral palsy is different than a TBI that happens in adult life or later on in life. So, for example, if I had a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, right now at this moment in my life, I have already established the motor patterns that I need mostly. So my brain already knows how to walk and coordinate my body and maintain my posture as I sit in this chair. My brain already knew how to do that before I was in the car accident or whatever happened to a stab cause my TBI. But when that brain injury happens to children under two years old, mostly under two, um, that brain hasn't established those motor patterns yet. And so it, it has that brain has much more difficulty learning those motor plans, learning how to walk, learning how to you know maintain posture because the tissue of that brain um, is already damaged. So I'm going to drop a big word here. There is this awesome thing called neuroplasticity, and neuroplasticity is kind of like it sounds. So neuro meaning brain, neurology, plasticity meaning how plastic or moldable the brain is. The younger we are, our brain is more plastic and moldable. It learns things more quickly. Our brain can adapt and rewire, and I think that's all super cool. That's why kids learn you know, how to walk, talk, you know, do all these things in, in a very short amount of time, but why it would take me 10 years to learn how to speak Spanish if I started it right now, <laughs> because our brains can learn things more quickly um, when we're younger. So the younger that children with CP start things like occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, um, the more the brain will be like, oh, okay, this part of my brain isn't working quite as well. So let's find another path, another way to do this. And the brain can figure that out and the outcomes are much, much better. So the earlier they start, the better it is. So while we're on the topic of outcomes, the benefits of equine assisted services for cerebral palsy are great, whether they start young or, you know, or later on in life. So the, the key to equine assisted services is especially for those with cerebral palsy, is that movement of the horse is king. So that brain neurological connection that happens with each step of the horse is fantastic for 
coordination and building those neural pathways. So we know that every time a horse steps, like at the walk, our brain, our body is adjusting, our body is compensating, our body is trying to keep us balanced, right, as we're sitting up there. And it's stimulating the same neural pathways that, that happen when you or I walk on the ground. So as we're building those neural pathways, building that, you know, laying the bricks, so to speak, of that connection, that makes coordination much easier than when they go to walk down the hallway after their session, right? We've seen if, you know, if you're alive and well in the equine assisted services world, you've seen some before and after videos of um, of children who are kind of right on the precipice of walking and that walking is a little bit more rhythmic. It's a little bit more strong after their writing session because they're building those neural pathways, whether they know it or not. So all they have to do is sit there, you know, on the horse, they don't even have to think about it and they're building those, those pathways. Um, riding also, obviously it builds the strength, the balance, the stability where they need it. It just helps with overall muscle endurance. So the longer they ride, the more they're firing those muscles, the, the stronger for long periods of time they're going to be. Um, obviously when we overlay it with horsemanship, it's great for cognition, vision, even things like self-esteem and confidence, all of those things. So as we get into the different types of CP, I think that you, you're all going to start to make the connection of what a great activity it is for those experiencing all of these different symptoms we're going to talk about. Symptomology, it's a little complex within the diagnosis of CP because after all, it is, you know, cerebral palsy is a collection of movement disorders. It's not just one thing that's very specific. Um, CP, it's not, it's not progressive. It doesn't, it doesn't get worse. Once that brain injury happens, that injury remains, but symptoms do change over time, especially as bodies grow, we get wear and tear on the, you know, joints and muscles and bones of the body. And as children grow and develop, obviously things do change. So that, that injury will remain, um, there and the symptoms don't progress, but you know, we see some changes. We have to remember that it is, after all, an injury to the brain. So there's going to be other areas that are impacted, like sensation, perception, vision, hearing, communication. Um, Even things like seizures can be really common for those that have cerebral palsy because that, that brain is disrupted. So just remember that symptoms are sort of a spectrum. So depending on how severe that insult was, there's just a broad range of symptoms. So it's important as instructors that we understand all of the symptoms, not just the motor or mobility limitations that we most commonly think of, especially seizures. I would encourage you all to make sure that you're paying very closely to seizures if you have someone with cerebral palsy that comes into your program. We should all have a policy on how you handle them um, and and what you do for that. So if you have more questions, um, feel free to reach out to me about that. But What's even more complicated about CP, as like I said, it's it's a spectrum, and there are different types, different types of CP. So different, different terms that we need to be aware of that are going to tell us in general what types of symptoms that person may be experiencing. So we're going to break down all the different types and sort of how we apply that to us as instructors as we get them mounted and get them going in the arena. Okay, let's get started. So the most common, um, about 85% of those with CP have what's called spastic cerebral palsy. So that means the person has abnormal muscle tone, the muscles are stiff, can be really rigid, and that makes both movement and mobility very difficult. Depending on where the brain was injured, it can impact different parts of the body. So it's not always the entire body that's affected. We're going to have a quick, weird Latin medical grammar lesson here. So the suffix, suffix meaning at the end, right? Plesia, plesia means paralysis. So if we put different prefixes in front of that, it tells us which parts of the body are paralyzed, quotes unquote, or, you know, affected. Diplesia means that it's either the upper or lower half of the body that is affected. Most typically, you're going to see the lower half affected with diplesia. Hemiplesia means one side of the body affected 
like either the entire left side or the entire right side of, you know, upper and lower body, but the body in halves. You could also hear the word unilateral. That's kind of a common word too, I think, that doctors are using right now um, rather than hemiplegia, but that means, you know, either the right or left side. And then quadriplegia, which means all four limbs are impacted, quad four. So all four limbs are impacted, um, as well as you could have the muscles of the trunk, uh, face, mouth, that could all be impacted as well. So you could see some total body um, symptomology there. It matters a lot to us as instructors which type of, of cerebral palsy that they have because this, you know, this medical form comes across your desk and it says quadriplegia. It's going to give you a really good idea of what areas of the body are impacted and what adaptations we might need to make before you even, you know, lay eyes on that participant. Um, I am going to put a cheat sheet to the areas of the body and classifications over in the Not Just a Pony Ride Facebook group. Um, if you're not a member of that yet, go over there. I'm going to put that graphic there that kind of helps lay it out a little bit easier um, to understand, especially if you're a visual learner rather than an auditory learner. Um, but anyway, back to business. With spastic CP, our primary area of attention, I mean, really needs to be on mobility. So how are we going to get a good position in the saddle? Obviously, safety is always number one. We need to think about the mount. We need to think about tons of things. But with spastic cerebral palsy, because we have those really tight muscles, we need to, to be thinking about position, um, especially if it's lower body. Are they going to be able to abduct their legs? That is, you know, spread their hips and legs far enough apart to obtain a good astride position at all. What does that now look like, right? I think things that we could consider are the style of the mount that we're doing. So a traditional croup mount over the back, that takes a ton of mobility in your trunk and your hips and your legs. So could we do something like a crest mount where we sit and then the leg comes over the front? That takes a lot less mobility to do. Um, if you are blessed enough to have a lift in your program, um, that might also be an option. We have a lift at Hetra, and it's it's really great for our participants that have a, have a tough time with that position during the mount. What about the size of your horse? So horses can obviously come in different shapes and sizes. Is your horse really narrow? You know, is it a narrow quarter horse or is it a really wide draft horse that you're working with? That really wide draft horse might be tricky for our participants that have those stiffer muscles in the lower legs um, and can't maintain that position as well. Um, you might be able to get it at first, but then might become really uncomfortable, either both for the participant or the horse, especially if they're squeezing with that tightness in their lower legs. Um, what type of saddle? Same thing. So what type of support can we give them, especially during the mount and dismount? Um, if you're going to do something like a crest mount, maybe not having the big horn and pommel, the Western saddle in the front, you know, would be super ideal. Maybe you go to something like English that they can slide on and off of a little bit better during that mount. So there's a lot of different adaptations we can make. But what's really important is that we get, you know, eyes in and hands on our participants before we mount so that we know what to expect and how to keep everybody safe. Because at the end of the day, safety is number one, right? Okay, so that's spastic cerebral palsy and probably the most common that you will see. This episode is sponsored by Stable Moments. Did you know that there are over 400,000 children in the United States foster care system? Most of these children have complex trauma needs, which makes them ideal candidates for equine assisted learning programs. If you serve or want to serve children in foster care, Stable Moments has a plug and play program model utilizing community mentors and equine assisted learning to develop life skills and heal developmental trauma. With their online certification program, you can become certified in this model and start serving kids by next season. What's even better is the program can be funded by Department of Children and Families and the mentors are all volunteers. To learn more, head over to StableMoments.com and check out their free webinar, Healing Trauma with EAL and Mentorship. The next type is dyskinetic cerebral palsy. 
This is characterized by three different types of involuntary movement. I'm not going to get super deep into those different movement patterns, but basically what you need to know is that with dyskinetic CP, there are, are involuntary movements. These individuals are going to have a lot of trouble with accuracy of movement because their brain is sending signals to their muscles that don't necessarily match up. That movement can be like abrupt. It can be appear irregular, come out of nowhere. The most difficult part, I think, is that it's involuntary and that participant can't do a lot about it. It can be really, really frustrating, especially because that involuntary movement can be triggered by voluntary movement. So they go to reach out to place a ring on the ring tree and their brain fires this, this movement pattern that's irregular, it's twisting, repetitive, it can be lots of different things, but you know, ultimately not what they're trying to do. And that can be really frustrating for those participants. So how are we helping them to be as independent as possible um, and be successful? In the arm scenario, I guess if I'm wearing my OT hat, I always think about how can I give this person the most independence while also helping them? So maybe I can help stabilize the shoulder or the elbow and let them have, you know, more freedom with their wrist and their hand. Maybe that can help give them a little more stability rather than just, you know, grabbing the ring and placing it on for them. So how can I help, you know, stabilize the more proximal or the more, you know, close to the body, to the core, um, to give them more distal mobility? Um, or I could do something like use a larger ring, right? That requires a little less precision that can help them be a little bit more successful, that type of thing. Maximizing independence and horsemanship, especially if that movement is present in the upper body reins, or excuse me, upper body, think about reins. So maybe neck rating is more appropriate or other, some other form of adaptive rein, like a ladder rein or that sort of thing. Um, just, I would really encourage you to think about how that movement is impacting your horse. So if you're hooked to upper rings or maybe in a side pole or something that's going to be a little bit more gentle, if that movement does, you know, accidentally kick up involuntarily, that participant doesn't mean to have those, you know, kind of sudden jerky movements, but can happen, right? So we need to be especially aware of that type of movement if it's happening in the core trunk, you know, hips, legs, because that's going to impact our horses a lot too. How sensitive is the horse that that participant is riding, um, especially to leg cues and that kind of thing? And how are we managing it? So maybe our volunteers can help with us, help that a little bit um, with the type of hold that they're using, what type of saddle. So maybe you might option for a Western saddle that has a little bit larger fender on the lower leg, um, or a little bit bigger stirrup or something that you can get a little bit more stability out of rather than skinny English um, stirrup leather. Also really think through mount and dismount because we know that this is a time that is obviously, it's safety is number one all the time, but especially during mount and dismount, a lot of things can go wrong because it's a lot of movement. And it's a strange position that we're putting our body in. Not a lot of participants, um, are doing something like mounting a horse on a daily basis. Um, remember that neuroplasticity thing we were talking about. So the more the more you do that movement pattern, the easier it will get because the brain will learn that that motor pattern. Um, one thing I sometimes will use is how does that participant get into the bathtub? That seems like a weird thing to compare a horse to, a bathtub. But if you think about it, you know, you walk up to, let's just say bathtub. You walk up to the bathtub, you put your hands on the rail of the bathtub, and, you know, maybe swing your leg in and then sit. So that can sometimes be a helpful tool. Sometimes, not always. Could help maybe trigger a motor pattern that is a little bit more familiar to them. Um, or can you, you can even ask the family, like, how do, how do they get in the bathtub, you know? And maybe they don't sit in a bathtub, that's fine. But, and maybe they might say, oh, they do it pretty independently. Well, that will give you a pretty good idea of, you know, maybe how the mount is gonna go. You never know, but sometimes a good parallel I like to make. 
baseline, just make sure you're safe. You have plenty of help if that movement pattern were to kick in, um, making sure that nobody loses their balance. Because remember, it's involuntary. You never know when that movement could happen. And so just always being prepared. Another type of cerebral palsy is ataxic cerebral palsy. Those that have this type have the most challenge with balance, depth perception, coordination, something in the OT field we love to call proprioception. So where is my body in space and how do I coordinate my body to move in ways I want it to? You're going to see maybe some wobbly or shaky movement, especially when those individuals go to do purposeful movement like move to mount or that type of thing. Basically what's happening is the brain is sending signals to the muscles that aren't necessarily correct. So the muscles are overshooting or undershooting to meet that specific target that they're attempting to to move. The difference, it sounds a little similar, but the difference between the dyskinetic, which is the type we just talked about, the involuntary movement that happens, you know, at any time, the difference between that type and this type, the ataxic CP, is that with this type, the, the shaky kind of uncoordinated movement is only happening when they're trying to move voluntarily, right? So that brain is overshooting or undershooting the target. In the previous type, the dyskinetic type, that involuntary movement is happening at any time. It could even happen when they're sitting still, um, you know, not trying to move at all. Their brain kind of kicks in this, this involuntary movement. So a lot of the same things are going to apply to the previous, you know, the dyskinetic type with this type, the ataxic type. So being sure that we're assisting our participants to be independent as possible with all of their movements, um, the adaptations or adjustments that, you know, we need to make. Something like trying new things like standing into two point or doing something like that, know that that movement pattern is going to be a little bit more tricky because that, you know, kind of shaky, uncoordinated movement could kick in when we go to make those voluntary movements, especially ones that are new. So something to chew on there with the ataxic type. Uh, The very last type um, is that we can have a mixed cerebral palsy. So that individual may present with a combination of symptoms from all the types we just talked about. Um, I would say most often you're going to see the spastic CP, so those stiff, rigid muscles, in combination with the dyskinetic cerebral palsy. So some, some muscles might be very stiff while having some of that repetitive kind of writhing, twisting motion, um, the involuntary movement. Other combinations are obviously possible, but I would say um, that those two are probably the most common that I see paired together. But those are kind of all of the different types. And now that you kind of know the symptomology, we can kind of apply what adaptations or things we might need to make. So first of all, you heard me say it on about every single type and, you know, every participant we mount, we need to know how we can safely mount and dismount really think in depth about how that's going to go because we know that cerebral palsy is a movement-based disorder. So the more movement that's occurring within your participant, the more symptoms you're going to see, the more adaptations we may or may not have to make. Positioning um, may also be really difficult, especially if those muscles are tight. So if we have involuntary movement, um, those things we need to consider are how we're managing that, how that's impacting our horse. Can we get good hip and lower leg position? So we know that that sets us up for success for our participant because if we have a nice, stable, good pelvic and hip and lower leg position, um, we can do a lot with that. It also protects our horse's backs. So we really just need to be constantly thinking about not only how does our participant feeling, are they safe, are they comfortable, but also our horses. Um, We also need to think about what kind of head and neck control that we have. We want to protect the spine and the neck. So if that movement is present in the head and neck, um, what kinds of things does the family do to to support that at home? Always ask your family what they do at home. That can help you in the arena. Communication. So if the area of the brain is injured that impacts their communication, how will you move forward in lessons? Especially, I just think especially if they need to communicate pain 
or discomfort or, you know, they're scared or something like that. How does that usually look at home? How do, how will it look in the arena? And how are you going to understand that with your participants? Um, pain is just something that we need to keep in mind for everybody, but it's also something that a lot of individuals with cerebral palsy experience, especially later in life, because chronic pain from joints, you know, that may be compromised or muscles that are just, they're stiff all the time. Those joints get a little rigid. Um, that type of thing, it's, it can be really hard and cause some pain. So we need to be checking in on that often, um, with our participants as they ride, especially if that's, you know, something they experience before they come to ride with us. Sitting astride in that position is kind of funny and not a ton of people sit in that position every day. So there may be some pain and discomfort that they experience just as a, you know, just as something that, that comes with something that's new. So check in with them, not only during their session, but, you know, maybe after they come for their first session that next time say, Hey, did you have, were you uncomfortable at all? Did you have trouble sleeping? Was there anything like that? Um, Cause that's going to give you a cue that maybe there was a little bit of discomfort there. Um, we also need to know that sensation can be impaired. Does that person experience pain in their daily life or do they communicate pain at all? Um, do they ever self-report it? Because if sensation, if the part of the brain that's impaired also impacted their sensation, they're not going to know. They're not going to know if they have, you know, some skin, maybe skin breakdown from the saddle or if their hip is really uncomfortable, they might not feel that. Um, like the way that you or I would. So just having a good kind of hold on on how that person experiences sensation and, and pain in general. Something else I think that's really interesting that I learned in OT school, um, but it's also, just so you guys know, a fact that's backed from the Journal of the American Medical Association is that the energy used to move by a person with cerebral palsy is three to five times more than that of a person without cerebral palsy. What does that mean? So endurance is going to be a huge thing to keep an eye on. The time that our participants with cerebral palsy spend mounted, focusing really diligently on position and posture and how their body moves and all of these new and different ways, that can be really, really tiring. So keep endurance in the back of your mind. Check in frequently, you know, maybe do like a scale of one to 10, something like that. Um, And don't be afraid to start slow. Uh, If you feel that you need to start with maybe, you know, 10, 15 minute lessons and make sure you're clear with the family on that. But um, obviously, as endurance starts to break down, fatigue starts to set in, we're going to see breakdown in things like posture, position um, and maybe even compromise safety as a result of that. So um, keep endurance in mind. Lastly, I guess I just want to remind everyone that a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, it doesn't always mean that cognition is impaired. Um, Even communication can be impaired, but cognition may still be typically developing or intact. Um, And so always meet your participants where they're at. Um, Communicate a lot with the families. Find out what they like, what they don't like, um, and that'll really give you a good idea on on where they're at and how to proceed with, with your lesson planning. So I just want to thank you all for listening to this episode. I know it's a little different than what we're used to, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think constantly trying to educate ourselves on the different disabilities that we see as instructors, even though we're not treating them therapeutically. Um, Some of you might be thinking, but I'm not a therapist, Katie. We don't expect our instructors to, to treat people therapeutically. But we need to understand our, the diagnoses of the participants that we're seeing because we need to know how to adapt, how to keep them as independent as possible, how to keep them safe. Um, you know, so overall, people just can really, really enjoy their experience with our wonderful horses. So if you made it to the end of this episode, I do have something exciting to tell you. Um, if you're interested in more disability education, we have a ton of it over at Hetra University. But also this uh, little podcast that I did is a small part of a webinar that I did called Common Diagnoses and Implications for Equine Assisted Services, which is a long fancy name for me breaking down a variety of diagnoses like um, CP, autism, Down syndrome, and spinal cord injury. And I just talked about 
what those diagnoses are and what the precautions and contraindications might be and why it applies to us, you know, in the arena. Here's the fun part, though. That webinar is free. It's the free webinar of the, of the month for our Patreon subscribers. Um, obviously, you can get it over at Hetra University, but it's going to cost you $10. Um, if you want to take advantage of this webinar for free, as well as tons more stuff like access to our monthly networking call, um, I just put the cantering checklist that we use. If you listened to last um, our last episode that we did, I put the cantering checklist up there. There's tons of other freebies and just things that can be helpful to us as instructors over on that Patreon. So you can click on the link in the show notes below and you get all of those perks, including the free common diagnoses webinar for only $5. That just makes sense. So if you're interested, click on the link and I will see you all next time. Shout out to the Cerebral Palsy Research Network who backed a lot of the factoids and things that I shared with you on today's episode. Thanks for listening to another episode. Until the next one launches, stay connected to our community by joining the Not Just a Pony Ride Facebook group. There we share exclusive educational content, answer your questions, and review new and exciting developments for the EAS community. Don't forget, if you have suggestions for future episode topics or a lead on a great guest that you think our audience would enjoy, click on the link in the show notes or visit us at hetrauniversity.org. This podcast is presented by Hetra University, an educational arm of the Heartland Equine Therapeutic Writing Academy. Hetra University's mission is to provide high-quality educational offerings to our participants and the EAS community. If you'd like to help us work toward our mission, you can make a donation by visiting us online at hetra.org. Again, I can't thank you all enough for helping Hetra change lives one stride at a time.